Uh, hi, everybody. So I'm going to talk a bit about a research project that uh, Ericsson is doing together with the Swedish Institute of Computer Science, uh, and which is a just-in-time compiler for the Allang Watch machine. Uh, yeah. So my name is Lucas. I've been working as a consultant at Ericsson for about six, seven years, working with uh, the Allang Watch machine, various aspects of different things for the last six months, nine months, something like that. I've been involved in this research project to work with the just-in-time compiler, on and off, depending on whatever else needs to be done. Uh, <coughs> so I'm going to talk a bit about the implementation details and different things about it. So some background first to see. So Beam is the name of the interpreter within the Allang Watch machine. It's Bogdan's Allang Abstract machine, or Bjorn, depending on uh, who you want to talk to there. So it's a register-based virtual machine using direct threading for its dispatch loops. It's written in pure, well, C, uh, C89. Uh, and it uses the GCC extension, extension uh, labels as values in order to do its direct threading dispatching. Uh, if we don't have that extension, if you're running on something like, for instance, uh, Windows that doesn't have this, we get some uh, we, on Windows, we compile it with GCC and use Visual Studio, Studio if we can, or otherwise we use a uh, big switch statement to do the dispatching. Not really important. And some of the optimizations that this virtual machine does in runtime is that it does some peephole optimizations for the uh, when loading code. So it does instruction combining and instruction specialization uh, when loading code. There's a bunch of other optimizations that is done in compile time. And if you want to know about those, you need to talk to somebody that knows something about the Allen compiler. This is not me. Uh, there. So this is the example that I'm going to be working through most of the presentation today. So it's, I hope this is a familiar function for most people. Uh, calculating a Fibonacci number eventually in the series uh, of some sort. So if we take this code and we compile it using the Allen compiler, we get what's called the beam format. So the beam format is what's inside the .beam files that are, is generated when you compile a file. Uh, the pretty printed version of that looks something like this. So we have, in this function, we have first we test if it's an integer. That's the thing that's coming into our function. Uh, we do a select val, which is a uh, dispatch table to see, depending on the value of what's happening. So if we have a 0 or a 1, we're going to jump to the label 3, uh, which is, you can see here. So la label 3, this is what we're going to jump to. And if it's not a 0 or a 1, we're going to jump to label 4, which is to do the rest of the code. So basic uh, control flow through this select val. And select val is done for when you have multiple targets for the same thing. So if you have uh, three or two or more uh, targets, if you just have two, you do a compare and you do other kinds of operations. So this is what's in a beam file when you compile something uh, in there. And when you load it, uh, you get something different. So we do op these optimizations that I were talking about that we do at load time. So you get some kind of uh, people and instruction combining operations. So the is integer test that we had before and the select val have been merged into this I jump on val zero instruction. So both this combines the test of is this an integer together with the dispatch logic of the select val into one instruction. And it also does specialization, which we can see at the end, which is the XFI over there. So we know that the input values here come in what's called the X registers of uh, our virtual machine. So we've specialized this instruction. So we've done both instruction combining and specialization for this instruction. And depending on the control flow, we can see that we get a pointer. So if we are not uh, within 0, 1, we jump to the red value. Or if we are, we uh, jump to the blue value and just return uh, the value as it is. Uh, there's in Beam, so the Beam code that's uh, compiled and, uh, to disk, there's about 180 different instructions. Uh, when we load it, that's about uh, tripled, so around 500, 600 instructions when we're loading it. And it's on these instructions that the just-in-time compiler is working. So that's why I'm introducing these instructions to you. If you want to see what's being done 
the debug command, ERTS debug, that's mentioned in the slide title, is how you can dump this information to disk and you can see what optimizations are done in load time and figuring out, okay, so why isn't this being done the way I think? Could it be faster? Uh, and different uh, varieties. And you can also, of course, go into the C source code and read what the specific instructions actually do uh, in there. Most of them are fairly simple, except for the binary syntax, which is a mess and uh, very hard to follow. But uh, most of the other ones are very simple uh, in there. So a single instruction, if you go in to look at it, so this is the I jump on Val instruction written in C code with a lot of macros to do various different things. Uh, it's not really important on it, that you understand, know what it means, but it, everything boils down to this C code that we are using just GCC to compile. Uh, everything uh, to go in there. Uh, so the Beam interpreter is nice. It, it's very small. It's easy to manage. Uh, it has a relatively small memory footprint when it's running. Uh, since it's been basically the same interpreter since the middle of the 90s. Uh, it hasn't changed a lot. And at that, that time, the memory constraints were a lot harder than they are today. And it hasn't grown a lot since then. So it's matured quite nicely. We, since we're running an interpreter, we don't have to cross-compile any modules. We have very predictable performance. We know that on different platforms it will behave relatively the same. Uh, and the implementation relative to a just-in-time compiler is very simple. Uh, and all the com most of the complexity comes from the Allen compiler and not in the runtime system uh, there. Unfortunately, rather than in comparison to a ahead of time compiler, like if you're compiling C code or C++ or something, it's relatively slow, uh, factor 10, 20 uh, slower than those, uh, if we're generous even. And because of the way that the Erlang module, model works, we cannot do any cross-module inlining uh, in different places in the Erlang compiler because you're compiling one single entity of an Erlang module, so we can't do any inlining across these things. And because of the way that Erlang tracing works, we can hardly do any inlining within the module either. So we have a lot of constraints on the compiler and what it can and cannot do at compile time, which doesn't allow us to produce as good code as we would like. Uh, enter just-in-time compilation. So in uh, the just-in-time compiler, we're trying at runtime to remove these constraints that have uh, this allowed us to make some of the optimizations that we want to do and instead do them in runtime when we know more about the system that we're running at. So what is just-in-time compilation? So just-in-time compilation is uh, you basically translate the interpreted code at runtime to machine code so that you can run it uh, as machine code rather than doing this interpreter loop and this batch logic all the time. Uh, and we can do specific runtime optimizations for your applications that when we, for instance, know that the lists module that you're running in uh, is the one that we expect and it has the fold with the implementation that we expect it to be, we can optimize for that specific fold and so on. So we have a lot of uh, optimizations that can be done and this is done also a lot of other languages uh, do these things. I'm sure I've missed some of these. Uh, like the JVM is the most famous example there. I've been using it for a very long time. Uh, the CLR has also been using it for a long time. And they all have different trade-offs, different platform characteristics that they use and uh, exploit depending on what the language is and what different things they're running there. We have the V8, so that's the Chrome uh, JavaScript, uh, Mozilla JavaScript engine that changes name more often than I change boots. And uh, the Lua JIT and the PyPy JIT is uh, some trace-based uh, just-in-time compilations. Um, there. So some of the requirements that we have on a just-in-time compiler for this is that it should be easy-ish to maintain. It shouldn't add a lot of maintenance burden. We're about uh, three, four, five people roughly at uh, the OTP to Nick Erickson that knows how to kind of do these things and spending more than one person maintaining it is not really viable. Uh, so we need to have something that's relatively low cost and maintenance and gives us uh, quite a lot of uh, bang for that person. Uh, we need something that is easily can maintain the, ups, the canonical semantics of the virtual machine. We don't have to worry about 
it behaving differently when you're running just-in-time compiled code versus running just interpreted code. Um, we want it to be fast, obviously, and we want it to be devoid of any user interaction. So you, when you're using it, you shouldn't have to say, oh, while I'm running this scenario, then I need to tune it in this way or something. It should be as seamlessly as possible for everybody. Uh, there. Um, we have chosen to use a tracing approach to this, so which is different from doing a what might be called a method-based uh, JIT. So we're uh, looking for uh, longer traces, so longer execution execution paths that's running in your code to try to figure out and optimize those. Uh, the general pipeline of the way that we do these things is that we as most JITs try to locate a hot function, something that's been called a lot. So in a normal system, this would be lists map, for instance. That function gets called all the time by a lot of different functions. Uh, most JITs try to find some hot place. And when you find that hot place, uh, we uh, tag a process that's running that code, and we follow along the path that it executes and records all of the different instruction that, instructions that it records until it either comes back to a loop or it uh, veers off in some direction and calls some other code. So we have some different heuristics, and I'll talk more about exactly what those heuristics are later on. Uh, from that trace, we generate a call forwarding graph of all the different uh, instructions, so we get something from there. Uh, from that call forwarding graph, we generate LLVM uh, intermediate representation code. So we have uh, in LLVM IR that we generate from there. And then we feed that IR into the LLVM compiler that compiles the code. And then we plug that code into the uh, uh, interpreter. And then we get to run the machine code rather than running the uh, interpreted code. I'll go through all, all of these different steps in more details now. So profiling hotspots. So when looking for where things are hot, it's very important that this is a very, very lightweight mechanism. Uh, so what we do is that we insert instructions at uh, function ingress and when you return from a function. So when every time you call a function, there will be a special instruction at the top of the function that says basically increment a uh, counter, increment a counter, increment a counter for that. Um, and we do it for entry uh, so that we can get like uh, tail recursive functions work very nicely so that when a function gets called a lot in order to work with body recursive functions so when you're popping the stack as well a lot so we want to optimize stack popping we also insert uh, these kinds of profilation counters when you're doing returns in your code so when you're doing uh, jumping back and in order to optimize the kind of code that's in gen servers, for instance. So when you receive a message and then go back to a receive loop and then you receive another message and you go back into receive loop, we also insert these profile counters when a message is matched out of a uh, process uh, so that we can get that in there so that we can optimize those loops as well. Uh, and it's a very simple counter. Uh, as you will see, we've tried various more advanced heuristics for this, but there are always this too much overhead and you don't get the enough data to weigh up the overhead. Um, so the inside the virtual machine, this is implemented as a small 32-bit counter that's embedded into the code. So if you're running a, uh, on a six, this is, the JIT only works on 64-bit systems at the moment. Uh, and 64-bit Linux with, uh, uh, special memory models for how you compile the emulator loop. So you can guarantee when you're compiling uh, C code that, that code is in the lower 32 gigabit memory span. And this means that pointers are only going to be 32 bit wide, which means that we have 32 bits empty, which is up here. So this is the normal memory layout of a call function, which is basically the address of where we want to uh, dispatch to, and the pointer where the new code is when we're doing the call. There. And the memory layout of the place where we're calling looks something like this. We have some metadata of the function uh, first, which is basically the MFA of the function so that we know where we are. Uh, then we have this uh, counter that counts how many times this has been called. 
Uh, we have an anchor, which is a pointer that says that, okay, so this is where a trace information is stored when something is being traced. And then we have the actual code, which is uh, just down here. Uh, and in the calls, we don't actually dispatch into the profiling instruction, but instead we're doing that inline into the call instruction. So every time you do a call, you execute something like this C code. I think this is directly copied from the C, from the implementation. So if the anchor is not null, we increment count, and if it is above a threshold, we start tracing. And this is done by all schedulers at all times, so this is very, very racy to do this. So you have, a lot, you have potentially 64 threads banging on this counter at the same time, and one of them is gonna, one or more is gonna find out that this counter has gone above the threshold. So when we, before we start tracing, there is a mutex that needs to be taken inside this anchor pointer uh, that's in there. So that's the way we synchronize multiple threads trying to do uh, tracing. And for return, the same thing is done. So we have a profile instruction with the counter in the return. So the return jumps up here to this point in place and increments the counter. And if it realizes that it's been again, then it does a, puts a trace on that process and traces that away. So that's how, yeah? Are there any bits to get those values? Yes, there are, there, there's, I think we have added like 10, 20 different BIFs to read this information out. So yes, you can use various uh, to inspect to see which ones are hot, which ones are not hot, how long ago they were encountered and these things. And we have various ways of figuring these things out. So yes, there are uh, ways to extract the information. Uh, so if we, now I'm going to talk a bit about the tracing and how that works. Uh, so if we remember this I jump on val zero instruction, it looks something like this. So, and in the C code, uh, we have like this. So we have a couple of different choices to make within this instruction. And uh, those choices that we make within the instruction is also part of the trace pattern. So not only which Erlang instructions are run is recorded, but also which path it takes within an Erlang instruction is recorded. Uh, so when we do this, we create a core folding graph of the entire interpreter and generate that. Uh, that looks something like this. Uh, and if you'll notice, this is the scroll bar. So it's kind of, uh, it's big. Uh, it didn't really fit on one screen. It fits on something like a 1020 screen screens if you have that uh, there. So in this, uh, as I said, there's about 180 beam instructions. That boils down to about 500 loading instructions. And that goes up to somewhere in the region of 4,000 different uh, blocks that we trace when we're doing the tracing of these different things. Most of them are very simple, but some of them are very complex, like, for instance, binary handling and so on are very, very complex instructions. So this I jump on val zero would in this graph be translated to something like this. And I've used like, and this uses the LLL, LLVM IR to do this analysis. So you can uh, compile the entire emulator loop to LLVM IR, and then you can analyze that to create these different uh, diagrams and also create, understand the call forwarding graph uh, of your system. So we use those tools very heavily to do this analysis. And basically what we do uh, there, after we've done the uh, analysis, is that we generate two different emulators. So we generate one that does the profiling, and we generate one that does the tracing. So we have two parallel uh, in interpreters in the system, and when we encounter something that needs tracing, we switch to the tracing emulator and run that until we just either find a trace or we fall off the hot path. And then we just, uh, as we're executing in the tracing interpreter, we record which of the basic blocks within the emulator we are executing and how many times we've executed that block within this specific trace. Uh, and then at the end of that, uh, we get a core following graph. Uh, so a trace for us uh, right now, this changes about every week when we try to fine tune different things, but right now 
a trace is considered complete if we get a loop on it, so we return back to the original, original instruction. Uh, a streak is detected, so we have a concept called streaks there, so it's a uh, longer path of execution that gets executed a lot that might end up in a different native call, so we, a function that we have already compiled to uh, native code, or it ends up in some other place that's very, very hot. Uh, but it's not a loop yet. So some kind of dispatch logic is normally the case. So we get these kinds of streaks a lot when we're running like the compiler or dialyzer kinds of uh, programs. Uh, and a trace is cancelled if it grows too long, is too wide, or is, is too unpredictable for anything. So if we have a lot of uh, traces going in different directions, uh, we cancel that trace because we realize that this is not going to be, we've, uh, rather we found that something that's very, very unpredictable in nature is not a good fit for the uh, tracing JIT compiler yet. Uh, there. And we do multiple iterations of a trace. So if a trace uh, gets run, just because it's run once, we don't compile it. Uh, we run it, I think, at the moment 16 times. Uh, so when a trace has been run 16 times without any new paths being discovered, that's when we uh, compile it into native code. Uh, so let's have a look again at the Fibonacci trace. <coughs> so this uh, function traces into something that looks like this. It's a, quite a nice trace. Uh, we have a distinct right side and a distinct left side, and this seems quite optimal for our tracing to optimize. <coughs> Sorry. So if we look <coughs> at the first path, which is the head of the trace, it's basically the decision tree, and it's the uh, code that we've seen before, the is jump on valve zero thing. Uh, and this is a zoomed in picture of the top here. So we have the top uh, decision, which is where the trace starts. So it starts at that node. And then it always goes down one step, so this instruction will always be executed. And then it makes a decision going either right or left in this decision tree. And that's the decision is if it's 0 or 1, it goes to the left. <coughs> if it's not, it goes to the right in the decision tree. Uh, yeah, and you can see also to the right there you have the original instruction. So these numbers here is the basic block marker uh, there. So we can see that it's taken, this is basic block 764, which is the path that it has here. And then it does 766, which is this block here. And then it makes a decision, either it's gonna go to 768, which is the fall through path, or 767, which is the other path. So the entire instruction is part of this, but what comes next is integrated into that decision. Uh, let's see. Ah, yeah, pictures. Uh, some explanation about the different numbers. So the basic block number, the amount of times we've traced this uh, block. So we've called this function 41 times before it decided that now it's time to do a just-in-time compilation. Uh, we have an instruction pointer, so we're in the code we are running. And we also have a breakout count. So the, mum, the number of times that this check failed when we're running the trace. Uh, this becomes important when trying to find exit paths that are hot uh, when code changes its behavior. And then on the right, uh, on the right side of everything, we have the uh, code that just allocates something on the heap and then runs the body recursive part of the uh, Fibonacci function. Uh, and if you notice down on the right side here, we have a breakout count of 684. So this is the reduction counter. So when we've been running this trace, it's run out of reductions has been preemptively rescheduled 684 times at this point. And that's nothing we can do anything about. So that's just a fine number. And that's needed to be there in order to guarantee soft time, real, soft time properties. Uh, we have the return instruction at the top of everything, which is basically what happens. So you get a zero or one. And then we get the inlining of the popping of the stack. Uh, no, first we get obviously the call uh, of this Fibonacci, which is going on the right side of this trace. So we get that part. And then we also get inlining of 
the popping of the stack, so the actual plussing of everything. And this might be one loop, or it could be when it's popping the stack of a lot of things. It could be a lot of uh, computations. So the entire function is part of one trace in this case, which is really nice. Um, so another example, a more complex example, is when you try to, for instance, get a trace of Ordict. Uh, so this is the Ordict function, which basically searches through a uh, list to find a specific element uh, in that list. Quite simple. Uh, when, I, when I run, uh, just start up the system, I get a trace on this. And the trace looks like this uh, when it's traced. So this is a lot more complex. And it's not run as much, and it's a lot less predictable. Uh, the reason for this is that the caller is part of the trace. So always when you're doing this kind of tracing, the, the, the most internal loop will be the first one that will be detected as hot. So in this case, since uh, ordict find is looping on itself to find the value in a list, that will be considered hot very quickly. But ordict find is uh, called from a lot of different places, and the actual return to the, these different places is what's causing this explosion of trace uh, places. So, for instance, it's being called by uh, Erlint in two different places. So, when we're running the shell, the Erlinter uh, is there. So, it's been running a couple of places there. And there were like, I don't know, 50, 60 different places that this function was called from when it was being traced. So what do we do about this? So that's where we have this counter that counts how many times a trace has been executed in one place. So by pruning all the different nodes in this tree that have been executed less than 5% of the times, 5% seems to be a good enough value, we prune almost the entire tree down to two, two cases left out of these 50 different ones, and we just get this little part here, uh, that seems to be these are the functions that call this function the most. Uh, so they will be part of the trace that we generate when we explicitly encounter this loop here. And if we look at the code that gets called there, it's not surprising that this is one of the hot places because we have basically a iteration going on around that audit found find. So what's this trace here is really seeing is that it, it's starting running here, and it goes all the way into the fold and back again he around here. So it's found the outer loop, and just in time compiled that outer loop for everything, uh, which is really neat. And for all of the other cases, uh, eventually, if something is hot, there will be a trace being started in that place, and that will encounter this native code and just inline that native code into the calling trace. So we still have this small kernel, and if we uh, work on just this code, and this code is very, very hot, we have a very excellent uh, trace running for that. But if in the future something changes in, in other places, then different traces will go into this specific place and inline those traces into other places. I hope that makes sense. Uh, so uh, by now, we've. So th this tracing logic and how that works and the, how we split the emulator into two different versions have changed a lot during the years. So we started working on this, or rather Frame, my, the colleague at the Swedish Institute of Computer Science started working on this 2013 maybe, so uh, three, four years ago. And uh, the first version of it tried to use uh, tried to do the analysis on C level to try to figure out the different parts uh, in different areas. The second attempt also did it on the C level, but using something called libclang, that's an LLVM tool as well, uh, that works on the CAST that Clang works on uh, in there. And the current version uses something called LLVM stack maps or patch points which is a way to instrument your code to make the compiler tell you where things are located in memory or in registers. So you, we can know, for instance, that the instruction pointer was allocated by the compiler to be in the register uh, R9 on an x86, for instance, or that the stack pointer is in a specific register. And as values move 
uh, in different instructions in different places. Uh, so that's helped us a lot. That was originally contrib contributed by the Mozilla team as they were working on their just-in-time compiler and integration with LLVM. I don't think they're using it anymore, but they did at some point. Uh, there. So once this is done, we have a trace, we compile it into native code, and the native code does a lot of optimizations as well. Uh, so this is the CFG of a compile trace. So if you'll notice here, there's only left four different paths over here, rather than being one, two, three, yeah, 10 or something like that. So the LLVM compiler together with our knowledge of what different beam instructions does and what you can assumptions you can make has managed to reduce these instructions down to being four instead of uh, 10. So that helps a lot with performance in different regards. Uh, so uh, one of the good things and one of the bad things about our approach at the moment is that we store all our information about the process in the same way as the interpreter does, which means that the Erlang registers, for instance, for argument handling and so on, is being stored in an array rather than being stored in physical registers. Uh, this has an impact on performance, uh, obviously, but it also helps, uh, but it helps us a lot when we jump back off a hot path. So all the time we have to assert that the conditions that were met when we were doing the tracing are still there. And if not, we have to jump back into interpreter mode. And by keeping both the stack and the register array as it sh would have been otherwise, uh, we can do those jumps very seamlessly and very efficiently back. Uh, there. Some of the optimizations that we do on these traces that are very, very helpful is that we consider like all of the code that's running is considered to be constant. So we can do things like uh, constant uh, folding and these things on constants that are running in the code. So if we have a trace that, if we have a function that inserts a constant into another function, we can know that that is a constant and do optimizations because of that. So if we, have, if we start and create a new dictionary and then call that into another function, we know that it will be a new dictionary. Uh, and it, it works very nicely. Uh, and we do a lot of redundant restore. So when switching back from the traced, uh, emulate, uh, traced in the native code back into the interpreter emulator, there's, we do a lot of an analysis to see what's actually live and what we need to restore when jumping back so that we can do a lot of, uh, we don't have to do as much reshuffling of things when we're running the trace. This takes a bit of time when we're actually compiling it, but it's normally worth the effort to not have to restore all of these different pointers in all of these different memory locations. Um, yeah, so the checks that are left there on the right side of the uh, trace is basically to check if we have uh, memory on the stack. We check if our argument still is a small, and we do a redundant check that our optimization hasn't figured out yet. We check if x0 minus 1 is still a small. And then we also have to check if we're supposed to be preempted. So those are the only checks that are left. And that's when, we, when those conditions occur, that's when we fall off the hot path. Uh, in there. So the first two are, the first well, one, two, and four are kind of have to be there. Uh, the third one, some optimization paths might be able to figure out that it's not needed. Oh, yeah. Uh, there. And the code that's being run is basically the code up there. So that's the small code. Uh, yes. So when installing one of these things into the code, uh, we reuse some of the profiling instructions and such that we've seen before. So the basic function ingress, so if you want to install a native code in this, we, the first thing we do is that we set the anchor to be null so that we don't care about the anchor anymore. This causes our profiling logic to not trigger anymore. Uh, if you remember the, the if statement that I showed you before with the profiling logic, it checked first if the, count, if the anchor was actually a pointer, and if it's not, then we don't do anything. Uh, so this is the reason why doing this check is because we want to do a 
efficient install of these native uh, counters. So we just put a null in the anchor. And after that, we uh, install the native code pointer and we write uh, forcefully over this data here. So we just put the native code pointer in that place, uh, doing proper SMP synchronization and so on uh, there. And then at the end of it, we overwrite the return instruction and put a JIT native instruction in its place. So when the co any process runs this code now, it will instead run a JIT native instruction, which will just call the function pointer that we just installed here, and it will jump there, and then it will execute the native code. So benchmarks, always fun. Um, so th th this works which is kind of amazing. Uh, we, it was a long time ago since we had any bugs on it. Uh, most of the bugs are is when we're trying to do new features and so on, we end up breaking things. Uh, but it's been kind of working since, I don't know, October, November, something like that. And since then, we've only been doing performance optimizations of various degrees and trying to figure out how airline programs actually behave and trying to figure out what's hot parts and how to do the tracing and what's good optimizations and what's not uh, in different areas. Uh, so running this function, uh, Beam takes on uh, my stationary computer about five seconds to run. Uh, fib, fib of 40, you get a big integer. Uh, running it with BeamJIT, so the just-in-time compiler, you get about 2.3 seconds. So uh, that's 50% uh, decrease in runtime, which is nice. Uh, if you run it with hype, you get even better. So we're not 100% there yet, but we're getting closer uh, to it every day. And the main reason why hype is better than us is this thing that we're keeping registers in the array rather than putting into physical registers for the argument. Uh, that's the main reason why hype is better than us at this. Otherwise, when, so when or if we do an optimization with that, we should be dropping down uh, in, the, in the same region. Uh, so running the benchmarks that uh, the hype team usually use to uh, evaluate different speed ups and different things when they're doing things. Uh, Beamjit gives about an 80% speed increase on those benchmarks uh, when running them. Uh, hype gives about double the speed uh, of uh, Beamjit, so we we are we are faster than Beam by quite a margin, but Hype is still faster than us. But uh, they wrote the benchmarks, not us. So uh, we are better at other things. And there's maybe three benchmarks that contribute about 60% of Hype's speed up there, and they all have to do with this register handling things, small, 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 small functions uh, there. And there's also some places where we're better. For instance, if you want to calculate the length of a list, Beamjet is your thing. Hype is relatively slow uh, in those benchmarks. But in the three benchmarks there is basically, I think, doing um, the Mandelbrot set calculations. Uh, is Hype is very good at and various other things. Uh, so in general, Beamjit is best at about six of these benchmarks. Hype is better at about 15 of these benchmarks. And four of them are about equal uh, there. So we're not there yet, but we have some ways to go. Uh, a f fun thing where you can do with benchmarks is that you can artificially induce something where you can see that you're on the winning side. So this is what I've done here. So we have a module that we've compiled with Hype. But unfortunately, the lists module in this case is not compiled with hype, which will create kind of a very bad scenario for hype. Uh, so for Beam, it takes about 2.5 seconds to run this. With Beam JIT, about one second. And for hype, it takes about five seconds to run this. So do you, have, you can do a lot of things with benchmarks. And uh, so here we have clear proof that Beam JIT is the best thing uh, that you can do. <laughs> But you don't have to read the lower part there. It's not. It's okay. Uh, so just compile your entire system with hype, and you're, you will be happy uh, in there. So that's the how it works. Simple enough. Uh, what we're going to do in the future. So we have some ideas about what we want to do uh, there. 
So we want to do some cross-trace optimizations. So optim at the moment, we're basically only doing inlining of traces into each other, but we want to take a step back and allow something like an Erlang process to run and look at multiple traces that are in the same area and do more aggressive optimizations across different traces in different areas after the system has kind of calmed down and reached just steady state. And we want to push these, the array of registers into physical registers because in, in small computational kernels, which is where we really want this to shine, this is where really what we need to get good performance. Uh, we also want to do more of a lightweight compilation strategy at the moment. We have to be very, very sure that we're gonna gain something in order to compile it. If we're not sure, it's a, it's a big cost for us to compile it. So we want to do some kind of multi-tiered compilation uh, things. And I think this will be our next step to try to achieve uh, something that doesn't take as much time to compile. And we want to be able to do more optimizations on the call forwarding graph. So doing more early optimizations of different kinds so that we can do reduce the amount of code that we need to compile and analyze when we're actually doing code generation. Uh, and take advantage of the way that the Erlang semantics work and that we can infer things across module boundaries in a way that the compiler cannot. Uh, yeah, that was it. Cool. Any questions? So I have a couple of questions. The first one, uh, those uh, profiling things, are they always on? Uh, no. Uh, they are on. They, they are they are blacklisted and disabled by the system if you, we detect that something is there. But they are enabled in load time. So if you start your system and you want to not run the just-in-time compiler, then you can put flags in there. Or you can disable them while the system is running as well. But basically. Yes, you should be able to, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, they're, they're not perfect, the values, because multiple threads updating the same value. Yeah. And the second question. Um, so no one has been working on height really for 15 years. Why not put the effort to make height even better and do it with the new compiler? Uh, good question. We, we, uh, the, this is a politics money thing. I, I, it's this simple answer. Uh, I'm not. Sh the, we didn't feel that we wanted to use the hype backend to do these things, and we wanted to explore something with the LLVM toolchain in order to do this compilation. And uh, Frey, the guy, had uh, some ideas about how to do this, and that's uh, why we're taking this approach. Uh, it's moving it in there. I don't have a very good answer for that, I'm afraid. We didn't. So forgive my ignorance, is, is the beam chip something that is in beam today? Uh, no. If not, when? Later. Sorry, I'm <laughs> not like the time question, I apologize. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't know when it, or if it will ever be merged in upstream. Uh, I obviously hope, I had hoped when I started on this in, uh, what is it, September, that we would have some kind of prototype in 20. That isn't gonna happen. Uh, but we're still trying to figure out exactly where this fits into our things or if we want to have a fully fledged JIT or if we're going to take small parts of it and put it upstream or what we're going to do there. So we don't know yet. This is research and we don't know how it's going to come into the product yet. Okay, please help me. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you.